Hello, this is Tanya Stevenson and I'm a student within the Graduate Certificate of High Performance Sport Leadership at ACU. And I'm very fortunate to be interviewing Jan Cameron, who is the National Parasport Mentor Coach for Swimming Australia, which is a new position that Jan has recently come into, and a very important role in the Swimming Australia leadership team. And Jan has had a highly successful career as both a swimmer, medalling at both Olympic and Commonwealth Games, and as a coach, coaching to Olympic and Paralympic successes. And she's the, rec the recipient of numerous awards, including a Platinum Coaching Licence, of which there are only 23 in Australia. Jan, as part of my graduate certificate, we're learning about team dynamics, which includes theories and practical examples of team development, leadership, effective communication, building trust, performance stress management. So the questions I ask you today will be about your experiences around these themes. So firstly, in a previous interview with USC Media, you attributed your coaching success to a no-nonsense style that encouraged independent athletes who were accountable for their own performances. Can you explain what you mean by independent and accountable athletes and how you go about developing these qualities within your swimmers? Sure, sure. It's, it's good to be here, Tanya, and I'm really happy to be part of your course. Um, firstly, independent athletes. I think that um, if you can um, bring leadership to the table in preparing uh, athletes uh, both along the pathway and for performance, uh, the best skills or the best you can impart to them is their ability to own their own performance. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that be um, getting themselves out of bed instead of mum and dad waking them up and serving them breakfast. Uh, it might be preparing their own uh, post-training breakfast the night before. It might be um, standing on the blocks being really confident because they know what they're going to do. So for me it's really important um, both in able-bodied swimming and in para swimming uh, which I've done both of extensively, um, to make sure that each athlete has the optimal for them stage of account of uh, independence. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously a 12 year old is not going to be as independent. They can't drive their car, they can't pay for their uh, expenses and mm -hmm. so on as maybe a 23 year old will, but it's all a process. Yep. And the process is if you're, if you're working with an athlete along the continuum towards winning an Olympic medal. It's all about them um, gaining, I think, the skills to be as independent as they possibly can. Mm. And for me here, uh, that means they then have accountability. Mm. Yeah. Right? So their ownership of their sport means their accountability for their performances. So those two go together mm. and it's a gradual Thing. And the more a coach works with a, a youngster along that continuum and instills in them um, uh, belief in themselves and their achievement, whether they succeed every time is not the relevance, mm. right? It's whether they, they set little goals for themselves and you are part of that process of helping them do that. Um, I had an example of a young... Um, young man who came and saw me when he was 21. This was in New Zealand and I had been not directly coaching him but coaching him from when he was eight right to 21 mm -hmm. and he brought in a large sheet of paper this day and he said I want to show you something. I said oh okay. So he put this thing on the wall he said I've had that on the wall from when I was eight to when I was 18. It's your pathway that you helped me establish for myself mm -hmm. with my swimming. Yep. And it had things on there like, you know, um, going to high school, you know, um, going into university. So it was a complete pathway. It wasn't just about swimming. Yep. It was things that, you know, I'm going to be 15 this year. I'm going to do these events. I'm going to be in grade whatever. And so that kind of thing we did together, but he owned it. Mm -hmm. And it was his accountability. And he said, I achieved all of those goals along the way. And I just want to come and thank you. Mm -hmm. So that was for me. I mean, that's more important than that boy winning mm -hmm. any medals. 
because yeah. it means he's a young man who's accountable for his own future mm-hmm. and he has the skills with which to achieve that. Mm. So for me, that's mm. critical in my coaching. Mm. So you sort of taught him life skills as well. Yeah, it's all about life skills. A great swimmer. Yeah. It is. It's mm. all about life skills. Swimming is just one vehicle that they do because they have talent, whether it be in music or whether it be in swimming or whether it be in academia, mm. whatever it is, that they make the best and independent decisions as they go through that and that they're accountable for results mm. at the end. Yeah. And, you know, the examples I gave you of, of the young um, swimmers that I have here mm-hmm. at USC, um, one came in at 14 and his mum would bring in his breakfast. I'd say, what yeah. are you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm just, he likes it nice and hot, so I'm bringing in his breakfast. So when he finishes, I go, no, no, no. We have a, a microwave and I want him to learn to look after himself, mm-hmm. you know. He's perfectly capable of doing that, mm. and you should be teaching him that. Now, he cooks up the family um, breakfast on the weekend on the barbie, and mm. he's very, very capable. Mm. And for me, those kinds of skills, they beget better results in performance because yep. mm. they are independent and able to stand and able to um, achieve what they've set. In other words, they're accountable for what they're doing, but. It is a step-by-step pathway, and Mm. it needs to start early. Mm. And it doesn't mean you walk away or that you're not a partner with them. Mm. It means that they're gaining those skills of independence. Mm. That leads nicely to our next question, which is um, being able to develop that accountability and independence in your athletes. You must also have a great talent for gaining that trust. Um, So my next question, relates to a consistent theme within the team dynamics course and it's the importance of trust within high performance teams and the developments of relationships that create a work environment where the sum is greater than the parts. From your success as a leader and coach, you must have a great ability to instill trust and develop very positive team environments. So how do you think you have this ability or have developed this ability? Is it something you have had to work on? in terms of becoming more informed and reflective, um, you know, looking at theories of emotional intelligence and working on that, or do you think um, it it must be a sort of innate skill as well or ability? Um, What's your views on on how you think you manage to do that? Well, I think that, um, I think it is somewhat innate, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. You must have a certain level of care of other people in order to instill trust. Yeah. If you don't have that, that emotional you know, yeah. um, uh, ability, then you're probably not going to instill trust. You, know, you need to go into a different kind of job. But yeah. I started out as a teacher and mm-hmm. that, um, um, that creates that, you know, the youngsters, they do trust you mm-hmm. for um, being able to help them achieve their goals. And I went into coaching in the same way. And I find that if, if you develop mores or standards, you know, mm. that everybody uh, has to adhere to, mm-hmm. not in a punitive way, but uh, in a building way, then each individual will bring something, mm-hmm. you know, to that group and take something from that group. Mm. But there has to be built into there a trust that we all respect and care for one another. Mm. And uh, that's a platform where on which you can build um, things like um, uh, getting people to do things that they mightn't otherwise want to do. Mm, yeah. Because if you have that platform, they know implicitly that you care for them yep. and that they trust your judgment and they trust you will be there for them. Mm, right. Yeah. So that's really a critical thing. And um, I have done a number of uh, short courses on different things, but I really feel that when you go in in coaching to coach a group, um, I started with three Mm -hmm. and then I finished with seven. Um, So um, each one that came in had to absorb the culture of the group that was already existing. And I was very fortunate. I had three uh, Olympians when I started here Mm -hmm. and uh, that grew to seven Olympians when I finished here. So... 
Um, the buy-in of the group means each one trusts the other, right? And each one trusts the group and um, they're able to be honest mm. because of that trust. And they, they know that even though uh, they may get ribbed or, you know, a bit of fun and games goes on, that ultimately everybody in that group loves and respects them and mm. that trust is there and it's two-way. Yeah. You know, it's two way the, mm. the trust. So it's something that's bigger than an, the individual. It's about Absolutely, to be much more. it is. Yeah. It's very important. You know, and each mm. time you bring somebody new into the group, and I, I spoke to a, a rugby coach in Christchurch. Christchurch was a and is a still a big mecca for um, rugby in New Zealand, and um, he's. I asked him the question. So, what happens when you bring somebody in from another club that doesn't have the same standards or expectations of your group. Mm. He said, I always look at the person that's coming in, that they add some value to mm -hmm. the group. If they don't add value, well, there's no point. point. Yep. And the group then has to mm. add value to them. So it's a win-win situation. That's really interesting. And I think that's, that's a good way, way of looking at it. At it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That ties with some of the theories we've been learning about um, this one particularly. Um, by someone called David Meister, it's called the Trust Equation, um, where leader in developing trust, um, um, the self orientation, I think, is a is an important factor in that. Um, it can't outweigh the the leader's credibility, reliability, and intimacy. Like how mm. there's been some examples of a very self focused leaders that um, have not resulted in very good outcomes in the long term because it's been more about them than the team or it's the true. individual. So it's true. It's an interesting I think that's way. essential. Mm. You know, that equation really shows it that, you know, you have to have credibility mm. because yeah. that's on that's right. Well, you have that that's where you build yeah. your your knowledge has to be um, able to be transferred to the to the athlete they have to believe in you mm, that's right, right and yeah. then the trust is an emotional thing mm. alongside that that you can build the trust for them and the group knowing that the group is the important thing mm. and that they're part of something really special yeah yeah mm. you've obviously done a very good job of that here at USC <laughs> this third question is quite a long one so I'll try and get through it quickly but in relation to trust and successful team environments there is a term a fish rots from the head first, which means that ultimately, over the long term, the fish, which can be termed, which is the sport, will succeed or fail, rot, depending on the quality of the head, which is the executive leadership. This is looking a bit bigger at sporting organisations. There have been examples in professional sport where self-orientation and a lack of diversity and integrity amongst the leadership team has resulted in a toxic culture and bad outcomes. For example, the Essendon Football Club with their doping scandal and the way that resulted for all the players and the others. Um, so what's your view on this fish analogy and what other elements in terms of leadership and governments do you see as critical to long-term success in high-performance teams? I think that um, the real crux of that is really respect. Mm -hmm. So if there's respect in the organisation, that's upwards and downwards, yep. uh, across the you know, mm -hmm. diagram as well, that um, people will then trust their people to do their job. Right? Now, I've been fortunate. I've had very good um, leadership from Brendan Burkett mm -hmm. here at the university. I've had really good leadership from Adam Pine, Assuming Australia, mm -hmm. um, but they haven't really interfered in the process of me developing mm. the team and the performance. Mm -hmm. But they have been there to support. Yep. And um, I think that respect, uh, which has to go both ways, um, is really critical in an organisation. Mm. So it isn't about the hierarchy coming down and telling people what to do but it's feeling that the person who's doing the job will know that they're going to get respect and appreciation yeah. right of what they're doing however i think that a really successful organization is is transparent in other words both up down and to the sides that everybody knows the philosophy mm. of 
where we're going and yep. what we're doing mm-hmm. and how we're going about it. Yeah. Right? So it's fairly transparent and therefore they're the people that you hire, you have to trust them to do that job. And if you if they prove not to be trustworthy or not to be able to do that job, then they should be mm. excised, if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Fish yep. head cut off. <laughs> right? But I just recently have moved into this mentor coach role. Mm. And if I can give you um, an example. When you're coaching, um, when you have put in place what we've been talking about here, you know who the people are who are leading the organisation, you trust them Mm -hmm. that they will uh, empower and enable you and outfit you with things that you need to do the job and then you you know that you can develop that same thing in your in your swimming group or for me it's swimming and that you have off to the side you have other people that you co-opt who do experts in various fields and they become part of your team Mm. so the team grows from three swimmers one coach to a cast of hundreds if Mm. you like you know so it it keeps developing but in the mentor role it isn't about coaching as in looking Mm. down at seven swimmers Mm. really it's more looking coming out of that environment and looking at 35 coaches yeah you know Mm. so the big thing with them is that they have to I have to bring that same transparency to them and say I'm here to help you so I'm, it's not about me performing, it's about your performance. Yeah. So how can I help you? Mm. So if, if everybody in the organisation has that same kind of, um, you know, understanding of that, that the people, you're doing your job here at the bottom level, if you like, you know, you're coaching and you're not bottom level, but that's the, the end of the line, yep. you know, performance. Mm-hmm. And the swimmers understand that you're... Uh, they trust you and that you're communicating and the communication is clear and they understanding the pathway and that that the person who's now in a mentor role such as I am and I'm dealing with the people above me to give me the opportunities to help those coaches get better then that will come all the way along the line yeah that that trust but the real transparency too of communication because um, there's nothing worse, I think, than than um, hiding other agendas yeah. in in something that causes a rot, if you like, the fish yeah. head, yeah. right? Uh, because it needs to be it needs to be open. Yeah. But the minute you don't feel that you're all on the same team or mm. that you're all in it together, mm. uh, then I think you're into really uh, the rot, if you like. Mm. Um, so that's what I think. Mm-hmm. It's about respect, it's about transparency, yep. and it's about everybody feeling that they have a role to play. Um, recently we had a um, uh, retreat, whatever, for want of a better word, of all of the office people and all of the people working for Swimming Australia. Mm-hmm. And many of them don't have any understanding of high performance, you know, mm. but the accountant does his job and yep. he pays the people who help the develop performance. But everybody being together was good because you were, you'd be able to put a name, yep. right, a face to a name, and you're able to uh, see what other people do. In other words, you're engendering more of another team yeah. and a transparency that can help you. They don't help me do my job, no, really. No. Yeah. I mean, if they don't pay me, they are. <laughs> right? If they don't make the bookings, they do. Yeah. But you know what I mean? It's more about uh, everybody respecting and knowing what other people do. Yep. And I think that's that kind of organisation, um, that, that creates a better flow, mm, yeah. you know? And the person, the swimmer, who's 14 or 15, won't see that. No. The coach who's swimming, who's coaching in Taralgon, won't see that. Yeah. But if they can see me as bringing them some support and help, yes. then that's that's really important. Yeah. And that's enabled because somebody's paying for me to get around to those coaches to do that. So what are your thoughts on the relative importance of money and culture in, within high performance sport? Um, yeah, and what do you see as the crucial elements of winning culture, of a winning culture? But um, winning culture is not something you can put in from the top. Yeah. Right, mm. that it emanates from the bottom. Mm-hmm. So it's about many people buying into the, um, the team, buying into doing it well, whatever they do, 
right? All the different parts and the sum of those parts. Yep. That creates a, a winning culture rather than somebody from the top coming in and saying, we need to have a winning culture. Mm. It's like, doesn't work, no, right? No. It doesn't work. It's got to come from underneath. And I think the best example I've seen of that in recent years has been uh, the All Blacks. Mm. And, um, of course, it's the number one sport in New Zealand. Hate to be using a New Zealand analogy again. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because it's different from what you see with the Wallabies. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So the Wallabies have had a series of good coaches. They've got good players. They've got, you know, money to do what they need to do. So they've had leadership as well. But the culture within the group is not the same as it was or it is in the all black culture. Mm, yeah. Now, wallabies have to beat off a number of different sports. They're not the number one sport here. Not as much, not as many people want to be a wallaby as say they do in New Zealand, mm. an all black. Mm. However, what I found was, and I was privy to the organization, which was really handy, was that um, that same thing that I'm talking about building here, as in a team made up of individuals who are respected, and who have the opportunity to become independent and accountable. That's from the very, very beginning. Mm. And um, of course, it's a numbers game in New Zealand. So many, so many potential young All Blacks. But the but the awareness of the leadership that the culture comes from below and that has to be nurtured and engendered yep. all the way through is is. Um, a greater understanding than trying to put something in from the top, top. and mm. create a culture. Mm. It's, it just doesn't work. I'm going to skip skip on a bit now to another area that we is we sort of prioritised in our course, which is um, performance stress and stress management. Um, so my question was, I can imagine performance stress is an extremely important thing to manage in high performance environments, such as the one you work in. Do you have a stress management plan and how do you assist your athletes in managing stress? Um, do you have any examples of sort of hard roads you've had dealing, supporting your athlete, athletes, like some that found it quite inhibiting? The and also, how do you deal with your own stress? Yeah, um, I think stress is something that's magnified if you don't feel ready, mm -hmm. if you don't feel prepared yep. and you don't feel confident. Mm -hmm. then you feel stress. I mean, stress is, a, is something that you have good stress, bad stress, whatever. Everybody has some stress in their lives, right? But I, I think that under pressure, if you, if you really know what you're doing mm -hmm. and you uh, have had a, a, a preparation that includes ownership and accountability for yourself, Mm. Um, and that you'll get in swimming on the blocks and you, you're confident in your preparation, you're confident in yourself, you're confident in your coach and you then um, don't really have um, any mm. reason to be stressed. You can be excited yep. and mm -hmm. uh, that level of su success might be butterflies because this is a big thing that you've been preparing for but it shouldn't be um, viewed as something negative rather than it help you just yeah. get the adrenaline going mm. so um, I think if you if you have done the correct preparation yep. and you have had independent um, progress you know progress in, in becoming independent and accountable mm. um, I don't think that that kind of stress should diminish your performance, especially in an individual sport where you are in control of your own destiny. Yeah. If you are in a team sport, you're dependent on seven other players or six other players and 15 other players. And of course, you know, you can't mm. determine their, their outcomes. Mm. And that's not to say that, you know, you're going to win every time. But if you do your best, that should be sufficient for you. Mm. So if you get up and you you do the best time you've ever done, you've improved and you're happy with your swim, it shouldn't matter where you come. Yeah. I, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, it should be I've done the very best I can. Yeah. The only time you should become disappointed is if you know you haven't done the best you can mm. for whatever reason. And um, we saw some of those examples um, in, in swimming 
not so much in the Paralympics, but in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And um, you do see it from time to time. Mm -hmm. People talk about it, you know, what caused them to lose the plot or what caused them to not perform. And those are individuals that have to um, go back to the drawing board, you know, look at their plan, look at their coach, look at their behaviours and uh, and go, okay, all right, I'll I'll tweak this or I'll tweak that. It doesn't diminish their capability, their talent, yep. but it might be something in that preparation that they might have to adjust. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, do we do performance stress training? No, mm-hmm. but in saying that, we put the swimmers under pressure on a regular basis, mm-hmm. which enables them to gain capability of swimming under pressure. Exposure to it, yeah. Right, mm. so that might be, and and the, the, the national coach at the moment is changing some of the format of the, of the program to say, okay, um, there's two things that are happening. One used to have heats at international meets. They have, in able-bodied swimming, they have heats, semi-finals and finals. Mm-hmm. Okay, and if you have that at, at the international level, it's very tough, very good, right? And the best swimmers usually get through. Mm. But if you do it in Australia, uh, the very best swimmers are maybe significantly better than everybody else. So they wouldn't have to go very hard in the heats. Yep. They could wait till the semifinals. Yeah. So he's taken away the semifinals, mm-hmm. which I think is a good thing. Yep. Everybody competes for eight places, right? And mm-hmm. that's it. Yep. So if you, ca- you can't afford to muck around no. in the heats. So he's put more performance pressure on the heats yeah. in order to get the outcome that's required, which is people who can handle the performance stress mm. getting through yeah. and teaching them to do that. Mm. The other thing is creating more opportunities to compete at a, at a high level, mm. an international level, more opportunities so that people become battle-hardened, if you like. Yeah. They, they go into it, they, they might be nervous at first because it's everyone in Australia they probably know, mm. whereas internationally there are new players and they don't quite know how this one's going to go. Mm. So it places them into a performance stress situation yeah. and the more that's happened, the more battle-hardened they will become, the more they will be able to handle any of the stress. Yeah. And that's just a process mm. um, uh, that they, you know, they don't get complacent, they, they learn to do that. Mm. Regarding my own been a long time since I've been what I'd call performance stress. <laughs> I, I get uh, anxious that they'll do what they want to do. Mm. That's the only stress that I have. Yeah. I don't feel any external stress that I have to perform. Yeah. I've long since lost that, right, thank goodness. <laughs> um, I really uh, I get, as a coach, you're a partner mm. in the performance of an athlete, so I get um, anxious not not performance anxious but that they will achieve what they deserve yeah mm. that's they care about your athletes yeah. and you want them to so that's best for them yeah. yeah i don't feel that pressure on myself yeah. at all mm. you know oh you better have swimmers better swim well or you won't be recognized as a good coach or something <laughs> no longer no. no no there all right yeah. mm. um, we're nearly out of time, so I'll just ask you one more question and then we'll, we'll round it up. Um, the other one that has been a big theme in, throughout this course is communication and um, it obviously is a very, very important um, element of being a coach and a successful sporting organisation in the way it communicates from the top down and across. The question was, um, within the high performance sport organisation, for example Swimming Australia, what would you see effective communication as looking like? Um, this is quite a general question between leadership, coaches, athletes, um, and how do you make sure communication is good? Like- I said to you we had this retreat recently, the mm. whole of the organisation. I think that's a good starting point. I think if you have one day instead of two and you have it twice a year, you probably get double the value from yeah, it rather okay. than just going two days and not doing it again till next year. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the regularity yep. of interaction mm. um, and I think that's important in every organisation and I'm in a, a possibly age, <laughs> my, uh, my age in my experience levels because I've been through from age group coach to um, 
performance coach to national coach to head of swimming and and now I'm coaching paras you know I was coaching paras now I'm doing mentoring Mm -hmm. so I've had a varied experience so um, I try to make sure that that communication from me across the board both in the coaching hierarchy and in the coaches that I'm mentoring that communication is done and that I try and seek if I don't hear something Mm. or see something that I'll go upwards and say you know what's happening you know but Mm. I I find if you initiate a lot of that sort of stuff that information's there and flowing but people don't always think you know communication is thing but it really is absolutely Mm. you know the the main thing in an organization to keep the organization going you could do it with um with with a newsletter mm. you know quite mm. simply yeah um and this is what we're all doing yeah um mm. which i think is quite good mm. um and it only needs to be a few lines yeah and especially if you have an, an organization where um there is an opportunity to get everyone together you know in, mm. in a social uh opportunity yeah you know which is not all work related Mm. Uh, I had we had a very good time on the fourth floor with the with the girls that were in admin up there yeah both um, uh, dietetics and um, and admin and um, just we just have um, morning tea every now and then yeah and everybody would bring something and just it was just really chatting oh what are you doing and what are you doing and so that kind of informal communication is really Mm. good for an organization yeah and um, I think I think that can help the leadership to make sure that everybody is seeing everybody yeah. and that they know they've got the finger on the pulse of what's happening. In yeah. Swimming Australia nowadays, they've got Players Association, mm, you know, yes. they've got Coaches Association, they've got yeah. Learn to Swim Association, mm. they've got, you know, education as part of it. So they, it is much more um, structured in yeah. that regard, which... Um, means that things don't get lost with one or two people trying to do everything yeah uh, I think it's better to have experts in in the field and filter that down mm-hmm. I'm very much involved in the coaching and coaching management area now um, but I see that communication as part of my job and that kind of leadership to be something that I can embrace and help others with okay, okay. thank you very Good. much for all of your insights um, You're welcome obviously incredible knowledge about many areas of high performance sport so uh, I've been around a much. long time <laughs> <laughs> well oh, thank you thank you it's good mm-hmm.